Well, uh, this, uh, so you've been told, is the Labour Party's election campaign operations room. Well, in fact, it's a studio at the BBC. Uh, we shall not be flashing up any gimmicky little cartoons this evening. Uh, we shan't be dodging around from one topic to another every two minutes. And uh, I shan't be sticking my face forward to pose phony little questions. The Conservatives, in fact, uh, don't think that the electors are fools. We think that at this stage of the campaign, you will want to consider some of the issues seriously. And that is why I have a list of questions here, the sort of questions that are being asked at public meetings, that I want to put to the Colonial Secretary and to the Foreign Secretary. There may, I think, be some of the questions that perhaps you are worried about in connection with Conservative overseas policy. Colonial Secretary, why is it uh, that uh, there are so many people detained in British colonial territories still who have not had a trial. Well, of course, on this, the socialist attitude is one of gross hypocrisy. They did exactly the same thing when they were the government of the day. In Malaya, for example, when the communist troubles were at their height, they, they detained without trial many thousands of people. Yes, but why is it necessary in the first place? For the same reason that we, ha we have to do it. Uh, when you get these troubled states, as they had in Malaya, and we've had in Cyprus and Kenya, people aren't ready to come forward and give evidence in a court of law against the murderer. Uh, if they did, as in Kenya, they were murdered themselves. Or in the case of in Kenya also, when people promised to give evidence and didn't turn up uh, in the court, their bodies were later found floating in pools or behind hedges. So what we had to do was to take action, as they did, as the socialists did, uh, about people against whom everything was known, uh, mm. but against whom no one was ready to give evidence. Mr. Dennis Boyd, now, what about Hola? Uh, the uh, Labour Party have made a great deal about the deaths of these 11 prisoners uh, in a, a prison in Kenya. Well, they are, in this, they are very unfair indeed to the government of Kenya. Of course, it's a, a great tragedy what happened at Hola, but it must be seen against the perspective. Uh, 70,000 people uh, have been sent home, gone back home through the camps, reclaimed and back leading civilized lives again. What sort of people were they? Well, these were Mama detainees and Mama convicts. And in order to get them accepted by their own African fellows back home, then it was necessary that they should throw off the Mama oaths and the Mama conspiracy. And in order to do that, they had to break a Mama oath, like working, and to show that they, none of the horrors that they feared would happen if they did break the oath. <laughs> and so sometimes, of course, when you take positive steps like that, uh, the tragedies occur, because the African warders, in this case, African warders murdered these men, the African warders may, may lose their head. But it must be set against this splendid task of rehabilitation. Uh, 79,000 people, you said? 70,000, some 70,000 have gone back home and are now leading decent and honorable lives. Now, uh, what is your aim in Central Africa and in Nyasaland in particular? Well, our aim is there certainly to see that through the Federation, the relative riches of Southern Rhodesia and Northern Rhodesia are available to help the development of the economically backward Nyasaland. And also, of course, at the same time, to press on with the development of Nyasaland in every other way, medical, social, uh, and constitutional. Uh, actually, I'm the first person to put people on the government of Nyasaland, uh, black Africans on the government of Nyasaland. Uh, the Labour Party uh, would like to break up this federation, would they? Well, not the wiser heads among them, but in this is amongst, on, on so many other things. It isn't always the wiser heads that settle policy. The wiser people, I think, believe the federation is a good thing. Indeed, they, 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 they first thought of it. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, these are the issues that have hit the headlines in the past, but uh, what else, uh, uh, over the vast majority of the British colonial possessions, uh, has the Conservative government been doing during the last eight years? Well, there have been some splendid achievements. Sh shall we look at them together? Uh. Ghana was then the Gold Coast and a colony. During our period of office, we've seen it become an independent member of the Commonwealth with all the rights and responsibilities that go with that. When we took over responsibility, Malaya and Singapore were living in the shadow of a jungle war and the threat of communist terrorism. Now, Malaya is a secure and independent member of the Commonwealth. Uh, in Singapore, there seemed no solution which could reconcile nationalism with the strategic needs of the Commonwealth. But we've found a solution so that the people elect their own government 
while our vital defence interests are, are, are preserved. In the West Indies, these beautiful islands are now joined together in a federation. Many years had been spent in discussing federation. We've had discussions too, but under this government, we've also had action. Then there is the Federation of Nigeria, with about 40 million people. While conservative governments have been in power in the United Kingdom, the three regions have become self-governing, and full self-government for the Federation itself is due in October 1960. And the ties of friendship between Britain and Nigeria are stronger than ever. What is our aim in East Africa? Our purpose is to encourage a non-racial approach to politics so that all races will regard themselves as Kenyans, Tanganyikans, Ugandans, as the case may be. The socialists talk a lot about African political advance in East Africa. But what did we conservatives find in East Africa in 1951? Then there were no Africans in the government of Kenya. No Africans in the government of Tanganyika. No Africans in the government of Uganda. Now, there are seats for two African ministers in Kenya. Three out of five elected ministers in Tanganyika, and there are three African ministers in the Uganda government. And in Central Africa as well, we support the non-racial approach and a policy of partnership between the races. Here, as you know, we have very delicate problems to handle. But we intend to have a commission which will study them on the spot, which will, of course, have a number of African members. I, as colonial secretary, am responsible for two of the territories in the Central African Federation. In northern Rhodesia, where lies the great copper belt, there are, but only since we've had a conservative government here, two African members on the Executive Council. And arrangements have recently been made for two Africans also on the Executive Council of Niasaland. But none of this political progress would be possible unless there is successful agricultural and industrial development. Here there's been a huge increase. Production in the colonies as a whole has gone up by 80% in the past eight years. But all progress depends on education. There are today two and a half million more children in primary schools in British colonial Africa than there were in 1950. Especially striking is the increase in the number of girls attending school. In the health services, great strides have been made. 50% more hospital beds in West Africa. 50% more qualified doctors than in 1950. Three times as much money spent by the medical departments in the African territories generally, as was spent in 1950. Now, in this gigantic job of changing colonies into self-governing countries, have the Labour Party helped while they've been in opposition? Well, some of them have tried to, genuinely. But I'm afraid too many of the leaders uh, have uh, identified themselves with the extremist socialists. And they've made difficulties all along the line. For example, they've encouraged the view uh, among African and other extremists that they'll get everything they want if there's a socialist victory. Uh, they uh, alarm other, other settlers and others living in East and Central Africa quite unnecessarily. Mm. They, they take, uh, constantly attack uh, British troops uh, and the people who are trying to do their job uh, under great difficulties. Uh, and, and yes, and Barbara Castle particularly and a number of others have continually made very serious allegations about British troops, uh, sometimes implying that they have tortured oh, the Cypriots and others. Is this it's still? absolutely monstrous. If ever we found any case like that we, among the troops, we have always investigated it straight away. And the vast majority of them have behaved with exemplary patience and good humour under the most appalling difficulties. And now, I think it's an outrage. Finally and quickly, or, 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 is all this really worthwhile, do you think? Oh, most certainly, sir. It's the most wonderful work in the world. All the time we are steadily adding uh, to the number of new free nations within our British Commonwealth of Nations. Uh, and we are steadily building up a partnership policy which is the only hope in East and Central Africa. It's, indeed, it's worthwhile. Thank you very much, Mr. Alex Boyd. And now I want to talk to Mr. Selwyn Lloyd, the Foreign Secretary.
Uh, in his time, he has been called by the opposition uh, organ grinder's monkey, a jungle beast. And uh, so annoyed I see that, that only last week, uh, Mr. Bevan said that one of the disadvantages of returning another Tory government to Westminster would be that that meagre and tousled figure, was it, that he said, uh, would be back at the Foreign Office. H how do you react to these sort of attacks? Well, if you go into politics, you've got to expect to be abused. But, of course, it's really irrelevant to the main question. The point is not what Mr. Nye says about me or what I say about him. The point is, who is going to get peace and keep Britain safe? Uh, what makes you uh, believe that you and your colleagues would be more likely to get peace? Well, we have the great advantage of having a united party behind us. The socialists are divided on almost every major issue of the day. Disarmament, whether to have the H-bomb or not, this so-called non-nuclear club, whether or not there should be support for NATO. On all these matters, there is a deep division in the Labour Party. But uh, it does seem at the moment that perhaps Mr. Gateskull has, has won. You don't hear uh, Labour members attacking each other just at the moment. Oh, yes, because of the, there's a general election on. But in fact, at the Labour Party conference, which didn't take place, which would have taken place this month, out of the 140 resolutions dealing with foreign affairs and defence, 118 were hostile to the official line. And what do you think of that official line, Mr. Gateskull's proposal of a non-nuclear club? Well, I don't think it's a, it's a start-up, because of the other countries... Uh, wouldn't accept it. And I think Mr. Cousins uh, exposed it as, as a piece of political dishonesty when he said at the Blackpool conference, we know they won't have it, referring to the other countries who would be expected to be members. Do you think that Labour could get on as well with our allies as the Conservatives do? Well, I think a, a, a Labour Foreign Secretary would have this difficulty that when he was negotiating about disarmament, he'd be all the time looking over his shoulder to see whether there was some revolt within his own ranks. And when it came to negotiations with the Soviet Union, well, I think he'd be the weak link in the chain. Mm. Uh, and the, the uh, Russian negotiators are very tough and they're very keen on finding wedges. The hammer and the wedge is in many cases their motto, and, and, and I think he'd be in difficulties. To change the topic, uh, you must be asked at many meetings about Cyprus. Uh, the, the Conservatives have always said that this uh, isn't so much a colonial matter as a matter of, of foreign policy. Why have you said that? Well, the, the Socialists have failed to understand from the very beginning what the Cyprus problem was about. It was not a case of simple self-determination and independence. Uh, the secret of the Cyprus difficulty was that one had to get the Greek and the Turkish Cypriot communities prepared to live in amity one with another. The, the Turkish Cypriots were not prepared to be ruled by the Greek Cypriots. If, you, if we had given them independence, there would have been a civil war, a bloody civil war in Cyprus, and I think Greece and Turkey might well have joined in that war in some form or another, and it would have been the end of, of NATO and a, a terrible disaster for European security. And uh, did Labour's opposition to you on this, continued opposition, have any effect, do you think? Well, I think it certainly protracted the trouble. In fact, they, they miscalculated, they misunderstood the situation. I think it's the greatest misunderstanding of any situation since Mr. Bevan came from Moscow, came back from Moscow in 1954 and said that Mr. Khrushchev really didn't count. Now, what about Suez? Well, a great many questions have been asked about Suez. And the decision about Suez was a very difficult and anxious one to take. But people who, who criticize forget some of the relevant facts. The mounting tension, 160 men, women and children killed on the borders of Jordan and Israel alone in a month just before Suez. The joint command of the Arab states, the Arab threat to exterminate the state of Israel and then action was taken by Israel and it was quite clear to us that that would spread into a war throughout the Middle East and we acted in an emergency and quickly to stop that war spreading and we succeeded. And uh, Labour opposed you then, and they uh, opposed the British and American landings, didn't they, in Jordan and Lebanon uh, in 1958? Well, they didn't vote against the Americans going to Lebanon, but they did vote against the British going to Jordan. But that operation saved the situation, not a life was lost, and I think every fair-minded person thinks now that, that it contributed directly to the easement that there has been in the relations between Jordan and her neighbours. And now for perhaps the main question. Do you think that there are good prospects uh, now for a disarmament agreement with the Soviet Union? Well, we think the time is ripe for another series of discussions with regard to disarmament. And at the United Nations a fortnight ago, I put forward a, a British plan uh, 
for disarmament, for comprehensive disarmament. I defined our aims as the abolition of all nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and the reduction of conventional arms to such levels that they would not admit of aggressive war. I put forward that plan. The following day, Mr. Khrushchev put forward his plan. And one curious thing, we have been accused in a kind of smear that we, we were cool or tepid about Mr. Khrushchev's plan. But in all the speeches which I've read, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Gateskill, has not once mentioned the British plan, the plan which we put forward, and speaker after speaker in the United Nations General Assembly has been praising our plan and saying it deserves careful study. Not one word from the Labour Party in support of that plan. And uh, your job... And, and, the reason, and the reason, I'll tell you, for that is, of course, because it was British. A plan produced by a foreigner, that's all right to praise, but a British plan, no, complete silence. You, for a number of years, have had a job that's been often described as a killer. Uh, what are the principles that guide you, the, the aims, uh, that make you want to continue with your work? Well, I saw a certain amount, firsthand, uh, of the horrors of a world war. Uh, and another world war, whether fought with nuclear or conventional weapons, would be a disaster for society. So our purpose is to try to, to, to get peace. But in trying to get peace, we've also got to see that Britain remains safe in the meantime. But there are many people who disagree with us about method. Honest people who have ideal, idealistic views, who believe that if we cast away all our weapons at once, we would get peace. I don't believe that's true. But that's an honest difference of opinion. I think that our method is the better one, and we are determined to do all we can by improving East-West relations, by pressing on with disarmament, to get the peace upon which our hearts are set. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. Well, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that I've been talking tonight to two people who deeply care about our overseas territories and about world peace. They have worked for these objects with imagination and with real sincerity. Too often, it seems to me too, that the Labour Party's foreign policy is just based on two things. First, Britain is always wrong. Second, whenever there's trouble, run away from it, no matter who gets hurt. But I suppose that one of the very major issues uh, at this election is about which party is going to be likely to get us nearer to peace. On the one hand, there's Mr. Selwyn Lloyd, who, with the Prime Minister and his colleagues, has helped to produce a world situation that's more hopeful than it has been for years. On the other is a Labour Party split from top to bottom, and nobody can deny this, on all the major foreign issues of the day. A wrong decision, you know, on October the 8th, could have terrible effects for all of us and our children. Well, I hope you'll think about it. Good night. On the 8th of October, you are going to be asked to vote, to decide the future for your country, for your family, and for yourself. Conservatives have been working for peace. Conservatives have been working for peace in Washington, in Delhi, in Ottawa, in Accra, in Bonn, in Paris, at the United Nations in New York, in Geneva, and in Moscow, in all the places where peace can be won. On the 8th of October, you are going to be asked to vote. It is your duty to your country, to your family, and to yourself that you should vote for peace and for a chance of a better life for everyone vote conservative that was an election broadcast on behalf of the conservative and unionist party